Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you, Tony. So, um, as you've already introduced myself, um, I'm a co-founder and company director of the Access Space Alliance and also chairing uh, one of our working groups uh, on laser communications, which, which currently counts more than 20 members. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, you to this panel on, on laser communications, uh, also known under the uh, perhaps more academic term of uh, free space optical communications, a technology that uh, I believe is, is well poised to remove the narrowing uh, bandwidth bottlenecks in, in satellite and, and space communications. Um, we have four esteemed colleagues uh, from, from leading companies in the field of laser communications uh, joining us from, from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and uh, I would allow them to introduce themselves and, and talk about their organizations and, and what they do. Um, first, uh, Mark Lepena of Xenesis, who has joined us from sunny Florida today. Um, he, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I'll share my screen here. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Access Space Alliance for uh, putting on the great event so far. It's been uh, interesting to watch some of the other companies uh, talk about their wares and their concept of operations and their business plans. Um, kicking off optical communications, um, what is Anesis? Um, you know, Anesis has been a development over several years, um, but we have emerged as a telecommunications, low, ultra low latency, low cost backhaul provider to the mobile network operator internet service provider and enterprise customer market. Um, over the past several years, uh, we've been conducting, you know, some deep feasibility studies and deep industry analysis, talked to probably, you know, 40 or 50 different um, analysts, uh, including Northern Sky Research, uh, Bryce, Bryce Space and Technology, <clears throat> Statista, and several other sites. And what we've really developed is a, a service that provides not only backhaul to mobile network operators, internet service providers, and enterprise customers, but also provides a turnkey entire ecosystem to the Earth observation industry. And what that means is um, one of the two of the main things that we uncovered in our analysis of the market and free space optical communications hardware market was um, it wasn't really a technology risk question. Um, over the past 15 years, technology has matured. What we found was um, it was really a lack of access to capital markets, which has you know, really put a stranglehold on the space industry until recently. Um, and it was a um, lack of a, a, of a full turnkey ecosystem, both you know, comprised of space and ground segments. And so Zenis has recently launched Zenlink, which is a full, uh, full system, uh, both for space segment and ground segment, interoperable 1550 on off key, very simple system. Uh, we took that approach because, you know, one of the largest barriers to entry is not only access to capital markets, but cost. A typical satellite constellation looking at deploying optical communications is looking at a price tag in the neighborhood of 20 to $35 million. And with very little exit metrics and very few companies even showing a profit at this point, uh, the real challenge would be going to your board and asking to do an A round or a B round or even a C round, and maybe in some cases a D round to adopt the technology um, that uh, is still in its infancy. So we basically solved that problem. Our, our customers can adopt free space optical communications hardware at zero CapEx and uh, deploy within 12 to 18 months of placing an order or whenever their satellite constellation is ready for deployment. Um, but ZenLink really is designed of ZenHub and ZenNode. ZenNode being the ground architecture provides a uh, greater than, uh, an equal to or greater than 10 gigabit up and down link uh, it's about 10 times uh, incumbent capacity. It's very secure. We all know that free space optical communications, uh, because of the narrow beam width, is uh, very secure. It's globally scal scalable, fully automated, and um, it's got about a 10x cost advantage. And, you know, one of the biggest barriers to entry for the Earth observation market, obviously, is uh, cost per bit of data acquisition. You know, your most of your businesses are really not satellite companies, but data companies. And to populate that data platform costs money. We reduce that cost by as much as 10 to 100x. But the market we're going after with our Earth or with our satellite communications constellation uh, is going to enjoy an, a combined average annual growth rate of greater than 90% over the next 10 years. And the markets we're going after are underdeveloped markets, uh, markets where mobile network operators are experiencing a very low average revenue per user and very low subscriber rate because of the lack of access to you know, independent and inexpensive backhaul. 
Northern Sky Research tells us that the, that the markets um, are uh, Asia Pacific and Sub-Saharan Africa. If you have any other questions on this, we'd be happy to uh, answer those um, and really appreciate the time this morning. And we look forward to uh, all your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next is uh, Ali Yunis of Maneric, a leading manufacturer of laser communication terminals uh, and one of the few elect suppliers uh, of the Space Development Agency for their transport layer tranche zero. Over to you, Ali. Thank you, Christian. And I am just clicking through Zoom to share my screen. Um, and here we are. Um, I hope everyone can see the screen. Um, Christian, thanks again for um, asking me to join this panel and, and thank you to Access Space. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to be here alongside uh, the other panelists. Um, Minaric is a manufacturer of uh, laser technology and uh, laser terminals um, across multiple orbits. Uh, so our uh, main goal has been across the past two years, not only manufacturing lasers, but actually industrializing the uh, laser community. And so uh, that has been the main mission. And the reason we want to industrialize the laser community is to dramatically lower the cost because laser technology has been a rather expensive technology um, up to date. And we certainly want to help proliferate um, laser communications given the proliferation of low earth orbit constellations and other uh, space and satellite technologies and projects that require laser communications. And so um, by industrializing lasers, you lower the cost, you lower the lead time, um, at, because as we see it, the, the cycles are getting shorter and shorter. And that means we have to be able to um, manufacture these lasers and make them ready for delivery and assembly and integration and technology just in time. And uh, what we have done in order to be able to pursue this approach is invest in very large factories as well as in sourcing specific technologies that are very critical, such as the manufacturing of our own telescopes and optics. Um, I'm not going to go over the slide because Mark uh, did a great job presenting it and presenting the advantages of lasers, so I'll skip over this. However, I would like to share with you an overview of the ecosystem that Minaric plays in. Um, we um, are across all the orbits and, and are on the ground. So going from left to right, we have uh, and manufacture systems, ground systems uh, that connect with uh, the space terminals um, as well as with airborne terminals. Uh, so we have gone throughout the entire value chain because certainly uh, the, the creating an ecosystem is very important and looking forward to um, having one value chain integration compatibility is very relevant. Um, in a nutshell, these are pictures of the products that go hand in hand with these different orbits, be it on the ground uh, or in space. And um, of course, I'm uh, more than happy to take any questions later on and uh, thank you. Thanks, Ali. Uh, joining from France, we have uh, Jean-Edouard Communal from uh, Mir Atlas, a, a startup um, that is set to become um, the weatherman of laser communications, if you will. Uh, Jean-Edouard, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Christian, and, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to being here with this great panel. I'm really looking forward to this uh, discussion. So uh, my presentation is going to be really short because uh, Mark and, uh, and Ali already uh, talked a lot about this. Uh, our, our, our goal is not to provide optical communication, but to uh, characterize the medium through which optical communication is going to go through, uh, meaning the, atmos yeah, uh, the atmosphere. 
here. Um, the, um, for, for optical intersatellite links, this is fine. It's vacuum. It's actually even better than fiber optics. It's by 30%. But if you want to bring the information down to the ground, you will need to characterize the atmospheric conditions. Uh, so that's what we do. We're, our mission statement is to measure the sky, really characterize um, uh, optically the, uh, the atmospheric conditions in order to, to prepare the ground segment for, uh, for optical communication. Uh, da, da, da. Um, so this slide is going to go really, really quickly. Um, I don't can you can can you sh see my screen? For some reason, I don't see. Yes, my... I can see it. Yes. Try again. Jean, we lost you. Jean Duarte, can you hear us? Jean Duarte, can you hear us? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Was I completely kicked out? You are there. We can hear you. I think I was kicked out. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. All right, okay, so I'll start again, and <laughs> where was I? Maybe we continue with Bob until <laughs> the All right, I don't know if you can hear me or see me. I guess you can. Shoes. You can see my screen, that's great. All right, um, so the idea is to... Um, uh, is to provide, okay, you have many advantages to optical comps, which Mark and Ali went through, so I'm, I'm not going to waste any time on this. The issue is that if you want to bring the all, all these advantages of speed, um, security, uh, and, and cost down to the ground, you will need to, um, to be able to go through the atmosphere. Um, the, the fiber optic is, uh, is already laid on the ground. Optical intersatellite links is equivalent to putting the fiber optic in the sky, even 30% faster. But we are aiming to characterize the atmospheric conditions so you can bridge the gap and actually see, uh, bring the data back to, back to Earth. And um, this is all very complicated because the uh, physics of the atmosphere is, is, is not simple. But um, if you can, uh, our goal is to make uh, the data very, very easy to access, very, uh, very simple, uh, in order to inform um, the, the ground segment design and uh, location. If you study how the, the, the past constellation have evolved and some of them have failed is most of the time it's because they underestimated the cost of the ground segments necessary to support uh, to support the, the operations. And we've seen massive changes with um, AWS ground segment as a service. Uh, Microsoft Azure has also announced this. So ground segment is shifting and is being software defined and the goal is to bring the data back from the Earth observation satellite, for example, as quickly as possible to the data centers. And uh, so where are, are the sites are, uh, are going to be uh, located? And are they going to be suitable in terms of cloud cover, in terms of turbulence, in terms of absorptions, so you can sustain peak efficiency in, uh, in your transmissions? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Sorry about the crash. I don't know what happened. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, we, we have Bob Bromley, a long-time promoter of laser communications who already predicted uh, much of, of what is happening today in, in this field uh, more than four years ago, I think, when, when we met for the first time at PTC in Honolulu. So please, Bob, um, looking forward to hear of your new visions. Stop here. And you got my video there or oh, just a second uh, I'll go ahead and get going on the slides here the uh, uh, thanks uh, Christian I, I'd like to point out for the benefit of the group that 
this panel is particularly interesting with respect to the laser comms uh, industry. Uh, we now have a nice strong mix of service providers with unique business cases. Uh, Mark at Zenesis is a good example of that. Uh, we, have service, we have providers of services unique to laser comms. Uh, JE's presentation with respect to uh, um, uh, the, uh, the atmospheric uh, contribution his firm makes. Uh, Mineric in both industrializing as well as creating scale uh, on optical systems uh, shows really a robust green shoots industry that wasn't around uh, in 2012 when we announced LaserLight. I'm here today to talk about uh, a sister company that we announced last year, which is another application uh, of laser communications, but in a very forward looking way. And that is Comstar. And Comstar is essentially a satellite that's intended to, uh, to serve what would be the growing and we think uh, expanding interest in lunar communications. Uh, its, target, uh, its target customers are lunar orbiters, uh, in probably from around 2000, uh, 2023 when it comes into service till about 2025, then habitations, uh, industrial development, all of which have different bandwidth requirements. Kind of fly through these a little bit. You can see that uh, the architecture is really a hybrid relay satellite system where you have a satellite Comstar, in this case, Comstar 1, which essentially is a hybrid satellite of both RF and optical, receiving RF signaling, which is for the near term gonna be the substantial amount of uh, backhaul off the lunar surface from the landers, but also optical. Uh, and uh, it can either convert on board RF to optical and take it to the earth to avoid interference of other uh, RF spectrum, or it can, it can relay the RF directly to its ground partner. Uh, the purpose of this is to essentially relieve what would be the high swap requirements that are necessary to essentially have high throughput, not low through, throughput kilobit service, but high throughput from the lunar surface back to the earth and vice versa. So it really is a, it really is a way station sitting in uh, a relay station sitting at L1. Uh, it's, uh, it can do a variety of services that are associated with both uh, data relay as well as cache, store, and compute on board. So it's a key and will be a key in the near term for robotic management and control on the lunar surface. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, I believe by Mark and again by, uh, uh, by uh, Mineric that we have an evolving system of systems, uh, which is how the military refers to it. But in this case, it's an ecosystem. Uh, the Comstar satellite is tapping into an existing ecosystem through a series of partnerships. Uh, Halo Mio, which is laser light for optical distribution around the Earth, uh, then it would, and that distribution would go to uh, laser lights ground systems and then on into the cloud, or else directly to Atlas space operations. But it's not unique here. Uh, Mark's system, for example, not only looking down to do relay, could in fact look up to do relay and serve as a relay for us. Uh, EDRS, its geo system, could in fact uh, relay. We could relay to EDRS and the geos could relay down. And what you're seeing here is a proliferation of the essential need for infrastructure in both, uh, not only in uh, what NASA now refers to as the near space network, which is out to 2 million miles, but in the area that is referred to as, as lunar and do it in an end to end fashion. Uh, Comstar's current partners are uh, Orange for termination in Europe, Lumen, which is CenturyLink for termination in the US, laser light for distribution on optical signaling through its network of con uh, constellation of satellites uh, Atlas Space Operations and Equinex. Uh, this is not an exclusive group, meaning in other words, it's open to any carriers who wanna join. Uh, and by doing so expand both the ecosystem but also the distribution capability. The cool thing is it's another application in a new business model uh, of laser communications uh, and it happens to be uh, between the earth and the moon. There you go, Christian. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Um, very interesting, and I think um, 
the, the scenarios of interoperability is, is uh, one we'll address later in, in the session, um, particularly when it comes to common standards. Uh, but when we look into the uh, laser communications industry over, over the past 12 months, um, I think uh, the industry has gained a lot of momentum, or some extremely exciting developments. So in, in August last year, the US Space Development Agency has awarded contracts for, uh, I think, a total of 20 prototype satellites with close to 70 laser communication terminals for the um, so-called Tranche Zero, which is just the precursor of a uh, planned satellite constellation um, that uh, transport layer, which would eventually consist of hundreds of satellites that will form a, a laser backbone in orbit. Um, then in February this year, Telesat finally announced its uh, light speed constellation of 298 uh, LEO satellites, uh, which will feature inter-satellite links. So we're talking about uh, around 1,200 LCTs on these. Um, so within just a year, um, the market size for laser communication terminals, to, to which I'll refer to as, as LCTs uh, hereafter, um, ha has grown from probably less than a dozen to, to the thousands. Um, so given these high volume orders, um, can 2021 be seen as, as the breakthrough to, to commercialization of, of laser comms? Um, Bob, maybe a question for you. I think the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the key to laser comms is going to be solid business cases that generate what would be the potential for scale. Uh, Ali's company is showing that. Uh, they, they have decided to move away, maybe not in, in total, but they have moved away from bespoke building to scale building. They've industrialized it, which is a key to scale. And they have a customer who's buying at scale. Uh, whether the customer buys 1,200 or 120, that's still a factor of about, I don't know, a 10X at 120 as to what's being made now. And until they can drive that down, uh, this is gonna be an interest, uh, industry that's bespoke. It's a, it's a huge event, uh, of what Minerica has done. And I think, yeah, that makes this year uh, a breakout year for commercialization, in my opinion. Want me to keep talking about it? Because <laughs> I'm happy to do, I'll talk all day long on this. Everybody, uh, everybody's nodding and say, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you're on a roll, Bob. <laughs> Did we lose? I, I, we I think Christian you know, uh, dropped off for a second. Yeah, you know, I, 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 can, I can add some color to that. I think, um, I think 2021 through 2024 uh, are, are really going to be, um, I mean, you got to think about this in the terms of, of the scale factor. Um, you know, what, what they're doing at Mineric is, is stellar, right? Um, they're really leading the way in, 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 in setting a good example uh, for other participants in the marketplace. And, and what that means is, um, you know, you look at, I, I hate to use a, a, a prime contractor uh, as an example, but, you know, Airbus made some great breakthroughs in being able to show how to build satellites at scale, right? You know, with what they've done for OneWeb. And, and, and what a lot of people are missing is, these are components that are part of a larger ecosystem. And so the industrialization aspect that Airbus has done and that Mineric is doing, uh, you know, with the LCT side of the equation, it's needed, right? And someone's got to go first. And, and usually those are the guys that get hurt the most. But in our industry, however, um, it's hard to be first because it's so capital intensive. But I think 2021 through 2024, I think we're going to see, I mean, Northern Sky Research says it's, thousand, it's a thousand terminals. And I think that that number is significantly low. When we look at what we're doing for our interceptor constellation, I mean, we're close to placing an order for 2,200 plus units, right? That just immediately scales up the entire industry. So, you know, I think, I think Bob is onto that, but I think it's 2021 to 2024 is when we'll start to see, you know, um, those returns on these ma massive capital investments. Yeah, I'll add a, a couple of words until Christian gets uh, back online with with his audio. But um, I, I must thank you, uh, gentlemen, Bob and, and Mark. Uh, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the kind words. And and uh, Minaric is is truly pursuing a COTS approach, a commercial off the shelf approach, where we're making 
this accessible, available by making it low cost, uh, having an accelerated timeline for production and just going at it in, in terms of large volume. And uh, it's, it's, a matter, it's a matter of um, do you wait for a customer order or do you believe in this market and you go after it, build it and they will come, <laughs> you know, as, as, as some will say. And, and we do have the faith and, and the minority management had the faith two years ago to uh, pivot to this industrialized approach and raise money and invest it in um, uh, thousands of square meters of factories that are capable of uh, building uh, many, several uh, units and terminals a month right now, which will very quickly ramp up to uh, multiple terminals a week. And by the beginning of uh, 2022, this will become multiple terminals a day, which is is unprecedented for for the industry, and and we're we're happy that we can support the industry and and, and support your projects, Mark, Bob, and, and all other projects as as much as we can. Thank you. So, um, the, the, the transport layer constellation will will not only feature inter satellite links, but but also optical links to the ground. Um, where are the challenges for laser links across atmosphere and, and, and how can, can they be overcome? Uh, Bob, LaserLight has, has worked on that. Um, can, you, can you shed some light on those questions? Yes, in fact, uh, we've worked with uh, John, uh, Jean Edward at uh, uh, Mir Atlas uh, on the very subject. Uh, the, uh, whether you're doing what Bridgecom is doing, which is point-to-point -point terrestrial, uh, or you're doing uplink, downlink, which is what a variety of the service providers on this call and, and other business models are doing. Uh, atmospherics has always been, uh, how do you deal with it? Uh, when we announced LaserLight uh, I'm, uh, at PTC in 2014, uh, as a real project, uh, somebody asked me that question in the audience and I was very glib, but very serious when I answered it and I said, we avoid the weather. Uh, and there was two reasons for that. One is that we did not want to basically overcomplicate the platforms with adaptive optics. Uh, that hadn't matured, that was seven years ago, it hadn't matured to a point that we felt that we wanted to take that operational risk. Number two is because it was an operational risk, we had already committed to a proliferated ground station program. So by going ground station proliferation, what you get is the ability to switch and route in advance and around the weather. But that's only subject to how good is your weather data. And weather data input analysis and then the ability to translate that into routing information is what uh, Mir Atlas is doing. And they wanna basically come into that market. So I find this panel really interesting because you're looking at scaling on, IC, on LCTs and you're also looking at, from an atmospheric standpoint, a lot of the, you've got really good vendors like Mir Atlas is, is sitting here uh, that have really gonna uh, uh, focus in that area. And for a service provider like me and like Mark, this gives us options to go buy instead of having to R&D it and build it ourselves. Uh, so let me share the mic over with uh, Sean Edward. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for your kind words. By the and, way, uh, in fairness, I have not bought anything from him yet. <laughs> yet, yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, essentially, uh, this is very, very in inspiring because, uh, okay, the, the optical satellite link is a very, very important step. It's the fiber in the sky. But how do you bring it through the atmosphere to, to get all that, that optical goodness down is, uh, is also a very, very important point. And the complexity comes down from cloud is obvious. You know, when the astronomers know that, you know, you avoid the clouds to look at the, at the stars. But the other two are turbulence and absorptions, uh, absorption from, from pollutant, from water vapor and things like that. Okay. And the turbulence is really the, the kicker here because it's barely, barely been measure, measured. Even astronomers only measured it by night and on very, very specific point because they put their multi-million multi dollar uh, telescope in the highest, driest desert on Earth. But the telecom business case is very, very different because you need to be close to the pop, to the internet point of presence. You need to be close to the data center. You need to be close to the population center. We are, or not, because so, some people might want to use 
fiber optic on an island somewhere in Santa Elena, for example, or in the Seychelles, where like, like Christian. And, and being able to access this data uh, is, is, is going to be crucial on how you going to dimension and scale your ground segment, which is uh, a, a very, very non-negligible -neg -neg cost. So uh, what we're trying to do is modestly to provide access to a, to a data parameter from, from the atmosphere, which was not available full stop before. And we try to do this at minimum cost and, and in order to be able to scale it up. The, the, the key word is also scale up as a standard instrument, which you, you can deploy in advance of your ground network. So you can do the site survey, the optical design, the plan the, the future operations uh, around the atmosphere. Because the big difference is doing optical comms in a fiber, doing optical comms in space, these are constant medium, but the atmospheric is constantly changing on the mini, millisecond scale. Yeah, um, so but Jean-Edouard, you have developed this, this instrument to, to characterize atmospheric conditions. So um, how does this, um, um, I think it's the integrated sky monitor. How does it work uh, and, and how does it facilitate laser links to the ground? Uh, it's not just one instrument. It's a bunch of instruments because you have very, very different uh, physical means of measuring uh, turbulence, for example. The, the nighttime and the daytime, are com it's completely different physics of the atmosphere. It's completely different way of measuring it. And, uh, and even the astronomers don't know the daytimes. You know, they're two different species. You know, they don't mix. Uh, and the challenge was to make these instruments um, compact and, and telecom grade. So you can really uh, make them easy. But it, it's, it's not a single instrument, what I'm trying to say, is that you have different old sky cameras, different technology, visible, weir, uh, telescope, um, scintillation. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a bag of, it's a big bag of tricks. Yeah, if, so, I can add, if I can add one thing to that, I'm going to turn everybody on this call into a laser comms expert when, with respect to atmosphere. When you watch the evening news and you watch the weather report, you're going to see one really critical intellectual property, and that is the weather moves. You'll see it. You'll see active weather activity. It'll move from one place to another. For example, when it's raining in Newport in Wales, it's probably a bluebird day in Dover. But when it's raining in Dover, Wales is cleared and it's probably a bluebird day in Wales. And so when you look at a service area, and I say said matter, any service area, the weather, if you're trying to deal with atmospherics, and I'm, and I'm discounting uh, sand and volcanic ash and, and that, that stuff right now. But just looking at the stuff we all kind of focus on in the troposphere. If you look at it, you have to understand the historic weather patterns of where you're putting your, your network. You have to understand how you can feed weather data in real time, as, as J.E. had mentioned. But you also have to plan your network operations and understand that when it's raining in Newport, Wales, it's probably going to be clear in Dover. And if you're taking a data packet and you're sending it into London, it's five milliseconds from Dover into London versus ten, five to seven milliseconds from Wales. In other words, it's an offset. So you think about that. So when next time you all watch the weather, look at the weather move and you go, oh, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, so, yeah, they're saying tomorrow this front's coming through, but it'll be clear behind it. And you're absolutely qualified to go work for JE. You know, you could probably be a weatherman at that point. I mean, they only have to be right 20% of the time and they make 300 grand a year. That's right. Well, you gotta have five nines, Mark. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, um, so we, we just talked about um, the, the challenge of getting the few hundred kilometers from, from Leo to the ground, uh, which, which at least in terms of distance seems to pale against the, the Comstar, uh, against Comstar, which uh, is set to bridge the, the distance of 380,000 kilometers between Earth and Moon. Um, this appears to pose an even greater challenge. Um, so what, what, is, what is your concept of, of operation and, and how would you overcome bad weather? You, you mentioned um, hybrid RF. Um, is, is, that, is that your uh, backup for a, um, you know, a cloudy day? No, uh, briefly, the hybrid RF is that we know that substantially the early days landers are all going to be on unified S-band and RF. They're not going to carry optics with them. So you don't want to give that market away. 
but you want to serve that market. You want to continue to serve that market by being able to do it with RF. Um, the optical market, we have to create the optical market. We have to go to companies like, for example, Ollie's, who are doing what they're doing with SDA and say, go to Ollie's company and see if they can do basically a telescope system for uh, what would be a lander. Uh, and, and start creating a market for telescopes. Those are bespokes, but they're also bespokes that are, are, uh, have a high, vo high, high volume potential uh, over time. So the hybrid part is to build into both segments. Secondly, our task to go from the, uh, we're 40,000 miles from uh, the lunar surface. Uh, count the constellations around the moon, uh, Pathfinder, for example, and we're probably around 30,000 uh, miles from them. And we're 200,000 miles uh, to the surface of the earth. We thought about putting a big sign up with the last connectivity for 200,000 miles because the swap challenge that, that is faced by those around the moon is so significant that if you had to make the whole trip yourself, then you're dealing with uh, megabit maybe RF links and you're dealing with megabit optical links, but then a, a blooming size of what would be the beam without regeneration, that would be substantial. Only serviceable at Tenerife and Hawaii and these in Adelaide and these large 60 centimeter telescopes. In our case, it goes only 40,000 miles from the river to us. We have a large satellite point with a lot of swap and constantly we can do onboard processing, buffering, regeneration, rebroadcast, forward store, a whole lot of things you would normally not do until you got to the earth. We we're going to do it at L1 and then turn around and signal that down. Now we can do we can do gigs to the earth, gigs of potentially to laser light if we adjust laser light's configuration or bypass laser light and go to Adelaide and deliver higher throughput because we've got, we've got a better beam. So that's kind of the idea for the hybrid, but the challenge our challenge is a lot less than Moonlight's or Artemis's because if they try to go on their own all the way, they're limited by how much swap they have up there to make that trip. So speaking of swap, your, your satellite, Comstar, will be at the Lagrange point, um, which, which is pretty far away from Earth. How large would be the LCT facing Earth on Comstar and how does it compare to a LEO LCT? No, it's it, it doesn't even compare to it doesn't compare to a to a laser light LCT. Um, the um, we're looking at you're creating two systems. One is, is LCTs that are looking at the lunar surface, forty thousand miles away. As Ali would know, that would be a different configuration than the LCTs that are looking at the Earth. Uh, you don't have eye safety issue, which is good. So you can actually go smaller aperture, higher power. Uh, and so ironically, what we do to accommodate eye safety, we don't have to do that up there until there, you know, until there in fact is a proliferation of what would be eye safety risk, because right now it doesn't appear to be. So I think it has to be, it kind of argues against where Ollie is going. He's got to commercialize to create an industrial base to have the extra R&D money to be able to cr create bespoke. And the same thing with, uh, with JE, if I go straight to the earth, I've got to be able to uh, connect to somebody. I connect to Mark and Mark's going to have to distribute it for me or else I connect to someone else, but I have to have clear skies. I've got to have basically sea, fall, sea floss to get there. So I'm a customer at Comstar of what's happening on the Earth's weather and also the weather in between, which would be the Earth and also where Comstar is located and also the moon because of the particular matter that can be stirred up on the moon. Yeah, we heard in an earlier session that dust might be an issue on the moon. So maybe we'll need to put ISMs on the moon as well, a new market for you, Jean Edouard. Uh, so very interesting. Um, uh, coming to you, Mark, I mean, um, Xenesis' mission was originally to build an LCT, so, so a hardware vendor. Uh, now, now, Eric, you, you intend to launch uh, your own constellation to provide uh, optical communications as a service. Uh, how did this change in, in strategy come and, and um, who are your target customers? Wow. Um, yeah, you know, <clears throat> I said this on a, a um, <coughs> excuse me, on a podcast the other day, space is hard. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
All joking aside, though, um, you know, we started off um, as a concept of operations to track aviation assets from orbit. Uh, we were working with Niels Boos. This is before they did their IPO, back when they flew, you know, Gomex 1 and Gomex 2, very, very small 3U CubeSats. And, um, you know, my background is in, you know, aviation and, and data science. And so we were trying to solve an original problem that, you know, created many more problems than it solved, really for us. Um, was really focused around, you know, trying to figure out how to downlink four and a half, five petabytes of data every day, you know, in an 18 hour window that was mission critical, you know, plane, planes flying towards one another at, you know, four or 500 knots closure is, you know, dangerous. Um, public trust comes into the picture, right? And so, you know, we really couldn't find a, um, a, a feasible solution to downlink that data. And Bobby Braun at the time was um, the director of the SSDL at Georgia Tech, went on to CU Boulder, and now is the JPL. And, you know, he turned us on to the LCP terminal we were originally licensed from NASA. You know, that was a great learning experience for us. And what we learned over the, uh, the about the year and a half that we, you know, kind of re-engineered and tore that unit apart was um, what was good about it and what was bad about it. Uh, what was good about it, it was simplistic. Um, it solved the problem, uh, but it also opened our eyes to a much larger problem. And that was the entire Earth observation industry is, you know, in need of a scalable solution uh, but in but an ecosystem, not just a terminal, not just a ground, you know, a piece of ground architecture, but actually a well thought out, simplistic, easy to remanufacture, easy to scale solution. So we moved into, you know, the solution, which is now Zenlink. And the natural, you know, evolution of that of that entire concept um, really led into, you know, Intercessor, you know, back when I first met Sean McDaniel at Atlas Space Operations, which is also, you know, one of our partner companies, um, you know, we looked at. Uh, you know, launching a constellation with a bunch of, you know, you know, uh, uh, Leo Link terminals, the, the, the NASA, you know, ter terminal. Um, you know, so uh, it's really evolved over a period of time. Um, you know, when you notice an opportunity in a market that represents a total addressable market higher than, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars, it's a piece of the market you definitely want to grab onto. Um, you know, the, the challenge we have as an industry, whether it be, you know, Jean, whether it be Ali, whether it be Bob, is okay, you know, who's your customer, right? You ask that question. We know exactly who our customer is. Our customer is the mobile network operator market, the internet service provider market, and the enterprise market. Now that's a really easy answer, but who specifically and why? Well, you look at Starlink. Starlink is launching a massive constellation. They're going after the end user. And Northern Sky Research tells us very emphatically and very clearly, and they're pretty smart guys and gals, <clears throat> that the average revenue per user is gonna probably be eroded by anywhere from 45 to 65% over the next 18 to 36 months because of the effect Starlink has on the overall communications industry, right? Tel telco. You add on to that, that their subscriber base is going down because Starlink will start taking those customers. And those are the two key critical components of access to capital markets, you know, liquidity, the ability to access a $2 billion line of credit with Deutsche or whoever that may be, and actually be able to run payroll. Right. So now you look at, you know, Verizon going off and liquidating assets. Right. They just got I mean, they just dumped AOL and, and Yahoo bad acquisition. Uh, and, and, and they're really starting to war chest. Now, why are they doing that? They spent fifty seven billion dollars in C-band auction. They only made forty seven billion last year. And so as their subscriber base goes down, as their ARPU goes down, cash crunch comes in, Starlink proliferates. They're going to need an answer they're gonna need another arrow in their quiver, and that's what Zenesis represents. So that's really who our customer is, the companies that are going to feel that pinch, right, of that average revenue per user and subscriber-based erosion. So your target market is backhaul to ISPs and, and MNOs and basically uh, replace the, the terrestrial aggregation network, is that correct? Well, you know, cellular backhaul is really, um, you know, for years people have talked about it, right? Um, but, you know, listen, the United States is, is clearly, and I'm not saying fast food, that's obviously one of the things, but, you know, the United States is an overserved market, right? Why would we come in and try to, try to unseat an incumbent, right? What we're looking for is, is, is kind of the horse latitudes, right? 35 Thor, 35 South, and, and populate that with inclined, inclined orbit. Now, we can cover 100% of that market with 48 satellites and 144 ground stations. We mitigate atmospheric interference. We subscribe to John's service. By the way, looking forward to doing business with John. Um, and, and essentially we're allowed to, um, you know, go after this greenfield opportunities. Northern Sky Research also tells us that the two largest growing markets that where the greenfield opportunity really is, 
is in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast or, uh, uh, Asia Pacific. We cover 100% of both, and we pick up Australia with that latitude. This is this is really um, well. Thank you for the shootout, Mark. And uh, I'm, I have to say, from five years ago when I first uh, learned about free space optical comms for new space, and um, three years ago when we launched the company, you know, if you had told me that in five years we'll be there, I would have signed right away. And I don't regret doing what we did because all of the complexity of free. Spa free space optical comms is difficult. The pointing, the tracking, I mean, all the guys that you guys, all the things that you guys do to make it happen. And nowadays we're talking about it like, yeah, free space optical comms as a service. And for the most complicated business case, which is telco with 99.9999 operability. This is amazing. This is truly, truly amazing. And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to take a minute to to recognize that, and it's it's really really impressive that we are in, um, th this industry and this application has gone such a long way in such a short period of time, and um, yeah, and and, and I, I think we're in the right situation as well because with COVID, everybody needs more bandwidth, we need more distributed uh, fringe access. And uh, and it's a perfect. Uh, the conditions are really perfect for free space optical comms. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think also another very uh, you know supportive element here is is um, the space development agencies' activities, um, procuring laser terminals and, and satellites, featuring optical links, and, and that volume uh, will will drive commercialization and is the much needed. Um, know um, um, driver here but um, speaking speaking of, of the uh, space development agency um, the the SDA has shown interest in, in using civilian satellite yeah. constellations for for optical relay services so so as a backup for resilience um, and I think in 2018 Teleset was awarded a contract to study just this um, so um, Will the, will the prospect of, of such government business um, force the market to adopt the, the SDA's uh, open um, ISL standards? So um, for, for the audience, the, the SDA has been proposing and pushing a, a um, open inter-satellite link standard, uh, OISL, uh, which um, yeah, is, is in the process of being, being developed. And um, uh, so Mark, maybe a question for you. You spoke about connecting to Earth observation satellites, other other satellites. Will you adopt the o, the OISL standard for your constellation? Well, I can't win or lose on that answer, right? Um, uh, you know, I, I think I think the it's a great question. Uh, I think the real question is, um, should we let um, government uh, decide uh, what commercial industry is going to do? Um, you know, I think, um, you know, there's been a there's been a standards discussion, if you will, um, for the last 15, 20 years. Right. You know, and and I, I like to equate it to Betamax and VHS. Right. Um, you know, it's a matter of adoption. Right. So, I mean, I think Ali and I could probably answer that question pretty easily by placing an order for or Bob and I can answer this question pretty easily by placing orders for terminals. Right. Because once those terminals are actually installed and they're flying, and SDA's, you know, uh, you know, is rolled into SSA or SSC, and then that's rolled into, uh, you know, Space Force. You know, it, listen, with administration changes, with concept of operations changes, once all of these satellites are launched and they start figuring out, you know, the actual physics behind, you know, interlinking all of these different constellations. Um, I, I, the, the government's going to be subscribing to a service eventually. Um, even if they own 50, 60, 150, 500 satellites, there's going to be holes in the architecture and they're going to need a system. I, I guess the real answer to that question is, um, you know, we go where commercial opportunity is and right now intercessor is the opportunity. So, you know, we're looking at vertical integration, um, you know, with our partners. And so, you know, I, I don't think we're going to let a, a standard issued by the government, um, by one government, dictate what we do on a global scale. Thank you. But <clears throat> even if more governments are involved, um, that, that doesn't promise success. Uh, I mean, we have the CCSDS, which uh, 
Uh, I've been working on a on a standard for optical communications for for cross vendor interoperability, um, which, which has left many many industry members frustrated, particularly because the industry had little say in this entire process, and um, also because it it is not particularly fast. So uh, now the SDA is, is rushing to set its its own standard uh, within a, a matter of months uh, by, by leveraging its its buying power. Um, is it the right approach uh, for a defense agency to more or less arbit arbitrarily set standards for a technology that that is still in in early stages? That you know, um, uh, where we still have a lot of, of open questions and, and and which will such standard prevail in the in the civilian world? Would shouldn't it be the the the, the private industry um, that that should make the trade-offs between capabilities and cost? Well, for the 30 seconds uh, of the one minute I think you got remaining, my view is this, is that if the government's the only buyer in the market, then by being the biggest buyer in the market, it has the appearance of cutting the pain. But when the market for government is 10% or 1% of the overall potential market, then all the government is saying is that for you to connect with me and get a contract, you have to do it this way. That's not a standard. That's a requirement. And what, right. uh, the way I go, uh, the way I rationalize this, they can, you know, Derek Tornauer can call it a standard, but it's not a standard. It's what it is. It's if you want to do business with me, ultimately one day there'll be commercial proliferation of networks and then they'll be picking up the phone. Derek will call over and say, or Space Force, I want to connect to your network. And they're going to be told you have to connect to me. And so connecting to me, this is my standard. And, and I, I go, I don't get any business from me. If I don't, I went, okay, I didn't get any business yeah. from you anyway. So that's fine. I don't care. Yeah. So can, I, can, I, can I add one thing to that real quick? Really you know, misleading. It's really, really misleading. Yeah, it is. And, and I think really what it boils down to is, listen, we want to play well with others. Um, you know, I think Ali, you'd probably definitely agree with this. Um, you know, you guys are you guys are the only company on this panel and this and probably in this industry right now that it's demonstrated through National Naval Research Lab an actual adoption of you know of a standard. Right? You've met the requirement. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I think what it really boils down to is you know we've designed our terminal um, you know as ne being nearly fully you know or fully software defined. So we actually have the ability you know within certain parameters on the physics side of it on the physical layer side. Uh, to actually, um, you know, containerize and adhere to several different you know, types of protocols. So, you know, I think Bob's right. It's a standard. It's not a standard. It's a requirement. Um, they're no longer uh, the biggest buyer in the marketplace. And um, uh, Christian, I'll I'll take just uh, less than half a minute to follow on that. Um, uh, so, what first of all, Christian, you said arbitrarily, and uh, I very respectfully uh, disagree with that. I think the SDA has. Uh, brilliant experts who know that uh, know the the laser market very well, and they're not arbitrarily setting require whether you want to call it requirements or standards. It's actually when you follow the RFIs and tranche zero and tranche one, it's a push and pull. Uh, they are collecting a lot of information from the vendors, seeing what the technology, uh, what what level the technology is at, what's the best technology out there, and they're collecting all of this and trying to streamline it and then come out with, again, whether you want to call it a requirement or a standard. So um, that's that's the first thing to be said. And they are currently the biggest buyer, as, as Bob mentioned, and that will certainly dictate something. And I just want to say, I do believe that a step like this is necessary because just take a look at the um, ground segment modem technology that has existed for decades. Until today, there's no one single standard because if you leave it, unfortunately, to the commercial world, you know, competitiveness and, and other specific elements get in between and, and then maybe you don't reach that interoperability, which would have helped the satellite industry in general had we reached that. So I, I very much welcome what's happening and I do believe it will be good for both the government and the commercial sector. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, for that. Um, we, we are nearing the end of this session. Um, I, I'd like to uh, thank everybody. I think it was a very informative panel, um, giving great insight into this um, still 
underestimated technology and, and the rapidly growing ecosystem around it. Uh, Ali, Bob, um, Joy Edouard and, and Mark, uh, you guys were awesome. I, I think we had a pretty good dialogue and, and you've given everyone some great food of thought. Uh, I wish you the best uh, of luck with, with your extremely thrilling endeavors and, and I look forward to, to hear uh, from your success in the, in the not uh, too distant uh, future. May the fourth uh, be with you. Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> Uh, for those of you uh, interested in joining our working group on laser communications, uh, which is open to all members of Access Space, uh, please feel free to, to drop me a line um, at Christian at access.space. Uh, thank you again. I'm uh, going to pass back to Tony in London. Tony, over to you. Sounds thank like the BBC. So much, Christian, and thanks, everyone. Uh, for you. the panel, it was great to, to hear you. Uh, I guess uh, we had a good time. Uh, you had a good time, actually, discussing all the intricacies of laser communications. Uh, bear with us, all the attendees. We have a short break with a, a five-minute video from uh, another company. And uh, soon after that, within 15 minutes, we'll have a regulatory and space law, space debris panel with Yvonne Henry. And that's before our chat and drink session later on today.